So in this video, we're carrying on with our confidence intervals and our determining adequate sample size and using our finite population correction factor. What we're gonna be doing here is just going through a bunch of examples, working through how to use each one and the like. And right, the big thing in doing this is really identifying which tool do I need for which job. So that's really the big part as we carry forward here. Without further ado, let's go jump in and take a look at some of these examples. So here we have our first one here. So suppose you have the following sample from a normal distribution with a sigma of five. So, okay, big thing here. So X is normally distributed and we already know that sigma X equals five. So, okay, that's a good sign. That means, hey, right away, sigma, well, I know, hey, if it's sigma, I'm going to be looking at some value of x bar, right? Because my two options are either x bar or p bar for confidence intervals. And, well, x bar is the only one that needs sigma. With that, right, my other kind of rundown is, okay, if I'm x bar, am I using a z or a t? Well, if I'm using sigma, if I know the population standard deviation, well, I'm going to be using a z. So kind of have my kind of train of thought as I'm going through this. And what I want to know next, construct a 90% confidence interval around the mean. So, okay, Z of a 90%. So, okay, my formula here, X bar plus or minus seven Z 90, all over the standard deviation of X, root N. Great, so I have all my parts there. Question is, what exactly is my sample size? What exactly is my X bar? I know sigma is five and I can work out the value of Z. Well, X bar, I need to calculate that based off of my raw data. So right, keep in mind X bar is my summation of X all over N. So, okay, there's my N again. What's that guy? One, two, three, four. So n equals four. Is that even a large enough sample to work with? Is that a large enough sample for x bar to be normally distributed to appeal to my central limit theorem? Well, what do we have here? We have that the following sample from a normal distribution. So okay, if x is normally distributed, we just need a sample size greater than or equal to three. So check, we're good for that. We can appeal to the central limit theorem that the sample mean will be normally distributed. Okay, so what's my value of x bar? Let's add all these guys up. So 23 plus 17 plus 14 plus 26 divided by four gives me a value of x bar of 20. What's my z 90%? Well, okay, keep in mind how we're gonna do that. We're gonna go and take a look at 90% divided by two, so 0.9 divided by Two is going to give me 0.45. From 0.45, I'm going to go to the table and I'm going to look up what the Z statistic is attached to that. So 0 0.45, that's going to be right in between 4495 and 4505. So that's going to give me a Z statistic of 1.645. So, okay, I have everything I need now. I have a X bar of 20 plus or minus a Z of 1.645. And then my standard errors, okay, that standard error, standard deviation of X is five, all over the square root of my sample size, square root of four, and I have my fuzz. So working out the fuzz first, five over the square root of four times 1.645, gives me 20 plus or minus 4.1125. So on the top hand side, right, I got 24.1125. On the lower side, I'm going to have 15.8875. So, okay, again, point estimate, X bar, Right, that's my one point in time, conducting a 90% confidence interval such that nine out of 10 times this covers the true population mean. There's my point estimate. There's that fuzz. 
as to what may truthfully cover that true popula population mean. So low is 15.8, as high as 24. Working that guy out, right? This case here, bit of a catch, raw data, had to calculate our value of X bar. Let's take a look at the next one. Okay, so we recently bought a new Chevy Bolt, and over the course of 41 trips, you determined that the average range, okay, hey, X bar average, to be 383 kilometers, right? And that average, that was over 41. According to the manufacturer, the standard deviation of ranges is expected to be 28. So, okay, according to the manufacturer, I'm taking that to be my population because, hey, that's from the manufacturer. They're going to have a good idea as to what that is. And what do I want to do? I want to construct an 80% confidence interval. So, okay, route we've gone down so far, right? Let's quickly take a look at our possible routes. We could be looking at P bar. We could be looking at X bar. If we're looking at P bar, well, we're going to be uh, if NP and Q greater than or equal to 5, we're going to be Z distributed, and we need to go through that. If we are X bar, we need to know, do I have sigma, or am I estimated with my sample standard deviation? If sigma, and in both cases, N greater than 3, N greater than 10, and greater than 30, right, my different assumptions, if x is normal, if x is symmetric, if x is anything else. So if population standard deviation, conditions met, z. If sample standard deviation, conditions met, then I'm dealing with my t and minus 1. So, okay, right off the start, hey, we have a sample average of 383. We know we're in this X bar world. Next thing we got to kind of differentiate, am I dealing with sigma or am I dealing with my sample standard deviation? Well, in this case here, sample standard deviation, well, what do we have? We have, according to the manufacturer, the standard deviation is 28. I said already, I'm taking that to be the population. So, given that, I'm going down this route. And we're going to be looking for the Z for an 80% confidence interval. So let's, let's go work through that. Let's get rid of our flow chart and start with some work here. So then working through this, we're looking for X bar plus or minus my Z, standard deviation of X all over root N. So, okay, X bar, we have that given to us. That's 383. Plus or minus Z for an 80%. So, okay, how do we do that again? 80 over 2 is 0 0.4000. Go out and try to find that value in the meat of my table. So go and look for that. As we do so, again, we've looked at this one a few times throughout the course so far. There is no 0 0.4000 exactly, but there is a 0.3997, and that gives us a Z value of 1.28. So Z of 1.28, standard deviation of X, that's 28 all over root 41. So working out my fuzz first, I'm going to have 5.597 as my fuzz, plus or minus my sample mean. And so that all together gives me my confidence interval on the high side, I'm going to have 388. Point, ah, let's go just 60. We'll round to that. And on the low side, we're going to have 383 minus 5. Point, we'll round to 5.6. So on the low side, we're going to have 377.60. So that is okay. Typically, I'd expect to get 383 out of my vehicle. That's what I have over those 41 trips. Given that standard deviation, well, plus or minus 5K. So fairly tight grouping here, fairly decent situation. However, keep in mind, it's only an 80% confidence interval. This we would only expect to cover that true population mean 8 out of 10 times. Does this one actually cover it? Well, it's tough to say, right? We don't know if this one itself does.
but 8 out of the 10 of them will. So it's likely this one would. Let's take a look at the next example. So, oh, this looks very similar. You recently bought a new Chevy Bolt, and over the course of 41 trips, so hey, okay, again, n equals 41, is this just the same question? You determine that you have an average range of 383. with a computed standard deviation of 28. Ah, see that there? That there is the big difference in this case here. That big difference, this computed standard deviation of 28K, this here, this is our sample standard deviation, right? We've now determined this computed standard deviation based off of our sample, right? And we can kind of see this as, hey, we took 41 trips, we determined an average, we determined a standard deviation. So, in this case here, S of X is 28K. And hey, if we don't know the population standard deviation, if we're using the sample standard deviation, well, then we are also constructing a T. And in that case there, let's back up. What kind of T is it? TN minus 1, so this will be a T40. Okay, T40 for an 80% confidence interval. Okay, so T for an 80% confidence interval. Let's think about what's happening here, right, as to how we calculate this using our T table. So what we're going to have is we have the T distribution. And right, if we think about what we're doing, it's the same as what we're doing for the Z. We're saying, okay, there's my mean. I'm looking for some value here such that in the middle, all together, is 80%. If that's 80% in the middle altogether, well then in my tails, this tail and that tail will be 10, will be 10. That is, if we were to go, if we were to jump over to our stats table and take a look at this, let's go and uh, take a look at that. So we have our stats table here. We are taking a look, again, we're looking for alpha. We said, okay, alpha was 10%. That's the amount in the tail. So with that there, we have 10 going down to 40 degrees of freedom. I'm going to have a T statistic of 1.303. So let's jump back and let's utilize that guy there. 1.303. From here, to calculate what we're looking for, x bar, sorry, plus or minus my t40 for an 80%, and that is the sample standard deviation all over root n. Putting in the values we know then, x bar, 383 plus or minus 1.303, 28 all over root 41. So let's work that guy there out. Again, let's calculate the fuzz first. So I'm going to get 383 plus or minus 5.6978. So I'm going to go 5 point. I'm just going to round that right to 5.7. So in this case here, what does that give me? On the high side, that's going to be 388.70. And on the low side, 383 minus 570 is going to give me 377.30. And right, what we see here is we see, okay, we had a bit of extra fuzz because we had to use a estimated sample standard deviation instead of a population standard deviation. And as a result of that, all else equal, right? Everything was the same in these questions, except we said sample standard deviation. The result, bigger value for our T statistic, and thus a wider confidence interval. Let's go back and take a look at the comparison here. So 377.30 compared to 377.60, right? So a bit of a difference there. Uh, I think that should have been 40, actually. That probably should have been 40. So bit of a difference, a little bit wider, not hugely wider, but a little bit wider. 
On the high end, 388.70, 388.60. So again, a little bit wider. Again, the reason why this is only a tiny bit different as we jump from one to the other was given our sample size. The larger the sample size, the more closely the T resembles our Z, and thus the less difference there is. If we would have conducted this in each case with just a sample size of 20, we would have had very different results. We would have had a much wider confidence interval in this case. So just a quick comparison of the two. Let's take a look at the next example. In this case here, Prime Minister has recently announced a new policy and wants to determine if he still has the majority support of Canadians. Taking a random sample of 100 Canadians, 55 are found to be uh, found to support the Prime, Prime Minister. So, okay, P bar, that is X over N. We sampled 100, and we found that 55 out of the 100, that is 0 0.55, supported. We want to know what is the confidence interval around this estimate. And I might be like, whoa, what? Aren't we missing a whole bunch of information here? Well, no, 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 we aren't. Let's take a look at the confidence interval. P bar plus or minus Z times our standard errors, which is just going to be P bar 1 minus P bar all over N. Right? All we need to know to calculate a confidence interval around a proportion is the sample proportion we received, and the sample size that we pulled out. Finally, what level of confidence interval we want to create. So in this case here, we want a confidence interval. Well, okay, P bar is Z, so we want a Z for a 95%. To work that out, right again, you can kind of think of it like we did for the last one. We have our normal distribution, that's a Z. And what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to cut it up such that we have here in the bulk, all that red shaded is 0 0.95, meaning in the tails, we have 0 0.025 and 0 0.025. Again, you might be like, hey, Keith, wait, how do you know that that's the values in the tails? Well, these have to be the values in the tails because it's symmetric, first of all, and B, all of these must sum to one, right? The entire area under the curve must equal one. So if that middle bit is 95%, the remainder must be 5% evenly split. So that is what we would need to do now is we would need to find out, hey, what Z statistic fits in here such that 2.5% is in the tails or alternatively, in each half, I would have uh, 0.475, 0 0.475, and then same thing, that half there, 0 0.475. So we go to our table, we try to find 0 0.4750 in the middle, we look that up, and we get a Z of 1.96. Perfect. So 1.96, what do we have? We have P bar, yes. We have our Z, yes. We have our sample size, yes. Okay, we're good to go. So 0 0.55 plus or minus 1.96 times my standard errors. What's my P bar? 0 0.55. 1 minus 0 0.55, that's gonna be 0 0.45 all over my sample size of 100, and then the square root of that whole thing. So let's work that out. Starting off with our fuzz, 0.55 times 0.45 divided by 100, all of that to the square root, times by 1.96, and we get 0 0.55 plus or minus my fuzz of 0 0.09, I uh, will say 7.5. So again, we have my estimate, my point estimate, and I have my uncertainty. I have my fuzz around that point estimate. So in this case here, what does that fuzz work out to? Well, on the high side, we have plus 0.55. That's going to give me 0 0.6475.
And then on the low side, we have 0 0.45, now we'll say 2.5. So there we go. We have our confidence interval as to where that true value of the population proportion may lie. So that is that final bit there in the question. Based off this result, can the Prime Minister be fairly confident that he has the support of the majority of Canadians? Well, given that this crosses that 50% threshold, it could be that that true population proportion is less than 50%. Based off of that, I would say no, no, you actually can't be too confident that you actually have the majority support because that true population proportion is likely somewhere in this range. Might be up here but very as much likely could be down here. So uh, you, can't really, you can't really discern for sure that you'd have majority support in this case. Let's carry on. Let's take a look at another question. Okay, so suppose the Prime Minister wants to estimate the proportion of the population that supports his current policy on health care. The Prime Minister wants the estimate to be within 4% of the true population, the true proportion, and assume a 95% level of confidence. The Prime Minister's political advisors estimated the proportion supporting the current policy to be 0.6. Okay, how large of a sample is required? So, okay, we're not looking for a confidence interval in this case. We're looking for a minimum sample size. So in this case, we want, uh, let's use the right tool, we want sample size greater than or equal to P, 1 minus p all over the z value maximum allowable error square. So, okay, in this case here, we know p, right? Our advisors believe this true proportion to be 60%. The Prime Minister's political advisors estimated the proportion supporting it to be 60%. That's what we think it is. Z. Z, well, that's a 95%. We just worked out what that is, right? We just said, hey, Z95, that's 1.96, right? We just did that right here. We know this guy. And then what else do we need? Maximum allowable error. E, well, we say we want our estimate to be within 0 0.04. So working that out then, what do we end up getting? Well, we get, in this case here, we get that our sample size is greater than or equal to 0 0.60. 1 minus 0 0.60, so that's going to be 0 0.40, all over 1.96 over 0 0.04 squared. So let's work that out. 1.96 over 0 0.04 to the power of 2. That works out to be 2,401.6.4, and that is what the minimum value of x is. So we're saying that, hey, n needs to be greater than or equal to 576.4. Or truthfully, we'd take that to be n is greater than or equal to 577, right? And always the question comes up, hey, but it's 0.24. Why are we rounding up? Why don't we round down to 576? Well, we're rounding up because we're saying that n is greater than this value. So we're always going to go up to the next nearest whole number, the next nearest whole sample. So that is in order to get this margin of error at a 95% level of confidence, that would be our minimum sample size. More, always better, but at least that much. How, how could we work through this question if we didn't know this bit of information here? Well, if we didn't have an idea as to what the true population proportion is, a good kind of cheat, as it were, would be just to assume, just to assume a 50%, right in the middle, just presume a 50% level of true population proportion and work through it as such, right? That is the case if you don't know. Typically, 99% of the time, you'll have a true estimate of that population proportion. But if you ever come across a question where that's not, you would just simply assume 
a population proportion of 50%. Okay, let's carry on. Let's take a look at some more. We have a pharmaceutical company. They want to estimate the population mean. Okay, so hey, population mean, that's telling me X bar. I'm doing a confidence interval here. Of their monthly sales for their 250 salespeople. 40 salespeople were randomly selected. Oh, okay, what's going on here? I got 250 salespeople and then I have 40, right? So the way that I'm reading that is that all together, I have 250 people and I am sampling 40 of them. So my entire population of salespeople, the number that I am sampling. Okay, their mean monthly sales were 10,000. So X bar was 10. 1000 with a known population standard deviation of 1000. So that's sigma x of 1000. We want to know the corresponding 95% confidence interval. So, okay, the question is x bar. Is this z95 or is this a t39 for a 95%? All right, which out of the two is it? Well, in this case here, we know what the population standard deviation is. If sigma, then z. So we'd be using our z1 in this case, not the t. z for a 95% confidence interval, what is that again? Well, that's just by chance working through this. What we used here, z95. What we used here, z95. So we know that value. We don't even have to go through that rigor more of looking it up. 1.96. Okay, so what's our equation here? X bar plus or minus my Z for that 95% times sigma X all over root N. But, whoa, let's hold that before we start calculating things. Keep in mind, we have this, right? This would be a pretty big red flag. I have my population size as well as my sample size being given. This should be a big red flag for us to consider our finite population correction factor, right? That is, hey, any time that n over n is greater than 5%, we need to use that guy there. And what was that finite population correction factor again? Our finite population correction factor, that was n minus n all over n minus one. So again, population minus sample, all over population minus one. So, okay, what do we get? 40 over 250, that gives me, right, 40 over 250, that is 0 0.16. That is, I'm sampling 16% of my population, that's clearly bigger than 5%. Yes, I need to use my finite population correction factor. So that would be times n minus n, n minus 1. Okay, so given that, let's work through it. Let's sub in the values that we know, and let's solve. So x bar, I have that guy is 10,000. Plus or minus my z, I have that as 1.96. What are my standard errors? Standard deviation of 1,000 all over a sample size of 40, so root 40. Finite population correction factor, square root of 250 minus 40 all over 250 minus 1, so 249. Okay. Big question like this, lots of stuff to figure out in each kind of state. There's some complicated, not really super complicated, but enough to make a calculator mistake. What I would recommend doing is solving each of these brackets individually and then multiplying them all together rather than doing it in one step. So what do we have? We would have 10,000 plus or minus 1.96. That's not too bad. Next one, 1,000 over root 40. So. One thousand over root forty gives me one fifty eight eleven thirty eight. 
Find that population correction factor. That is 250 minus 40 all over 249 to the power of 0.5. That is take the square root of it. And we're going to adjust that 0 0.91. Uh, we'll go 835 or 84. Let's keep it to four decimal places. Okay, so I have my sample, right? This is my point estimate. Plus or minus my fuzz. Let's multiply all these together to get that fuzz. So finite population correction factor times my standard errors times my Z statistic gives me fuzz of 284, uh, 6. And then 0, 0, 0, 006. So we'll stop at that 6. So point estimate 10,000, 284. That's my uncertainty. That's my fuzz. So what do I get as my final confidence interval? Lower limit, upper limit. Well, that's 10,284.60 on the high end. On the low end side, we're going to have 10,000 minus. And that will be 9,715 and 30, now we'll go 40. There we go. So I have my confidence interval saying, okay, based off of this, we want to figure out what the mean monthly sales were. We got a sample mean of 10,000. We're saying, okay, cool, point estimate, the true population monthly average sales are likely somewhere in this range. At least 19 out of 20 times, that would be correct. 19 out of 20 times, this would cover the true population mean. Okay, let's carry on another example. Okay, last one here actually. So, hey, this looks familiar. This looks like the one that we calculated the first time. So, is it the same question? Well, let's take a look, let's read it carefully and let's see. Suppose we have the following sample from a normal, I'm assuming from a normal distribution, construct a 90% confidence interval around the mean. Okay, so what do I know? I know that I want a 90% confidence interval. I know I want it around X bar. I know I have a sample size of four, but what else do I know? Well, let's go through our root. X bar, we either know sigma or we know our sample standard deviation. If we can appeal to the central limit theorem, well, in this case, we are from a normal. So, hey, n of 4 checks that box. Sigma would be z. Sample would be a t. In this case, we'd be looking at a t3. Which case do we go down? Well, looking at it, we do not know what our population standard deviation is. And you might be looking at that, you're going, but Keith, we don't know what the sample standard deviation is either. You're right, it doesn't say it in the question, but we have the raw data. That is, with this raw data, we can calculate this. This is going way back to the start of the semester now. And you're like, oh no, I thought that left us. No, 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 it was just sleeping, right? It's coming back. And so in this case here, we can calculate our sample mean, we can calculate our sample standard deviation, and then we can calculate the confidence interval. So let's go through those steps. So as we went through that flowchart, we know we're looking for a T3 or a 90%. So altogether, we want X bar plus or minus T3 all over S of X root N. So the reason why I want to write this down is it kind of gives us a plan of attack. It gives us everything we need to find out. I need to know what my value of x bar is. I need to know what my t3 is. And I also need to know what my sample standard deviation is. And I know that. That's 4. I have that information. Let's start off with the easy one. Let's go work out what it is for our t3. So again, thinking about it, there's our T3. Let's just scroll down a bit so we can see that. There's our T3, normally distributed. And we have 
some kind of situation such that in the middle, what are we looking for? We're looking for 90%. If it's 90% in the middle, well, the two tails together are going to make up 10% or 5% in each tail. This here on our t-table, that's my value of alpha, alpha of 5%. So let's jump over to the t-table. Let's go take a look at what that guy works out to be. So in this case here, we are looking for an alpha of 5% and three degrees of freedom, giving us 2.353. So 2.353, let's go take a look at that. 2.353, great. So I have my t-statistic. Now I need to find out my x-bar, need to find out my sample standard deviation. So let's work through that guy next. So x-bar, that is the, right, we can write it down over here. Just remind yourself, x-bar is the summation of all my x's all over my sample size. My standard deviation, that is the square root of the sum of x minus x-bar squared all over n minus 1. So these are the two that I need to figure out. I need to start off with that guy because we need that guy for this guy. So let's list our x's. 23, 17, 14, 26, all of that there, that sums to 80. 80 divided by 4, well 80 divided by 4, that's going to give me an x bar of 20. Next step, Okay, I want to get x minus x bar squared. So let's do that together. x minus x bar, and then we'll square it all in one step. So 23 minus 20, that's 3. 3 squared is 9. 17 minus 20, that's negative 3. Negative 3 squared is 9. 14 minus 20, well, 14 minus 20, that is negative 6. Negative 6 squared, that's going to be 36. And then 26 minus 26, 6 squared, 36. Okay, I want my sum of squared deviations, so let's take the summation of that. 36 plus 36 plus 9 plus 9 gives me 90. I then want over n minus 1. So, okay, keep in mind without this square root, I have my variance as 90 all over n minus 1, so all over 3. 90 over 3, that gives me 30 as my variance. Take the square root of that to get my standard deviation. So 30 to the half power, or square root of 30, gives me 5 point, uh, we'll go 477. Right, always good to carry around a few extra decimal places in the intermediate steps here. 5.477. Okay, we now have everything we need. We filled out all of our boxes, so let's go back up and let's calculate. 20, that's my x bar, plus or minus t3, that was 2.353. Standard error, that was my standard deviation, my sample standard deviation, all over my sample size of root four. Okay, so working that out, let's work out our fuzz first. So we have 20 plus or minus, plus or minus 6.4433. Six, so 6.44 that gives us a confidence interval of 26.44 down to 20 minus 6.44 13.56 so let's compare this right that was using our t3 and our sample standard deviation Let's compare that back to what we first calculated. And let's just carry this with us. Well, once again, what we witness, this guy here, this was Z, sigma X was known. 
this guy, and that guy was my T3, that is sigma x was unknown. Distinction between the two? Well, big distinction between the two is that typically, more or less all it's constant, typically with our t, we'll have a wider range, right? We won't have as accurate of an estimate. Here we're saying, okay, 15.8 to 24.1. Well, in this case here, using that t, we're estimating both the sample mean and that sample standard deviation. So double estimate, we're introducing more air, more fuzz into everything that's going on. We get a wider confidence interval. In order to have that same 90% level of confidence, we need to cover more of the number line. So again, to compare the two, all else equal, the T, right, using our sample standard deviation will always give us more air and thus a wider band. Okay, fast and furious, we went through a whole bunch of different examples. We calculated confidence intervals. We calculated our sample mean. We used a finite population correction factor. If you have any questions on how we utilized any of this, how we looked up any of these values, where we got anything from, please feel free to reach out to me, D2L, frequently asked questions, or via email. Thanks.